Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, Mr Bloomfield. My name's Dr Dixon. I'm a locum GP standing in for Dr Wright. What can we do for you? I've been having some problems with my breathing. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit more about this? Well, I keep getting breathlessness and wheezing in my chest. It all started about three weeks ago, and I've been coughing a lot with it. Some white phlegm. Mm -hmm. I thought it might be a cold coming on. But then, after about another week, I started finding it more and more difficult to catch my breath. Right. So, you've had the wheezing and the breathlessness for roughly three weeks? Yes. Give or take a day. And do you get these bouts of wheezing and shortness of breath every day? No, they come and go. How frequently do you get them? The first week, there was only one, I think. And then they started getting worse, um three, four times a week. Mm -hmm. It's not being able to get my breath that's really worrying. And so the attacks, have they increased in the past two weeks? Yes, they're much more frequent. OK. When do the attacks come on? Uh, at any time, but they seem to be worse at night and in the morning. Have you noticed any change in the severity of the attacks, especially in the morning? Yeah. Do they wake you up at night? About three times a week. I see. You been off work at all? No, but I nearly didn't go in yesterday. Was that the worst so far? Yeah. And have you had anything else with it? Um, I've felt a bit tight across the chest. Any pain with it? No, just tightness. Are you aware of anything that triggers the attacks? Um, like what? Well, dust, feathers, new carpets... No, I can't really say I am. OK. Have you had any infections recently, like flu or sore throat or chest infection? No, not for a long time, except this. And what about medications? Are you taking anything? No. No aspirin? No. Are you doing any exercise? Jogging, for instance? No. What about pets? Do you have pets at home? Um, no, but my neighbours have a cat but I don't see it that much. Hmm. Everything OK at home? Yeah, things are fine. And what about work? I see you're a civil servant. Hmm. Any stress or problems at work or anything like that? Hmm. Work's been um, getting me down recently. In what way? Well, there's been a lot of changes going on recently, and I suppose I'm a bit anxious, what with the mortgage and that. Hmm. And this has been getting to you? Yes, more and more. I see. And does the wheezing, etc., continue over the weekends? Um, no. When I come to think about it, it doesn't. OK. Some general questions. Have you ever had anything like this before? No, never. Do you have other illnesses? Um... High blood pressure, diabetes or heart problems? No, nothing like that. Mm-hmm. This is the first time I've been ill in my life. Has anyone in your family had anything similar? No, not as far as I know. What about eczema? Anyone in your family with that? Both my sister and my mother have it.
Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. You hear a physician talking to a patient. For questions 13 to 24, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning. I've got an appointment with Dr. Gonzalez at 8.30. Okay. Please be seated. Let me check with your record. In the meantime, please sign in and be seated. Hmm. Margaret Nicholson? I'm here. Follow me to room number three, please. Here we are. What's the reason for your visit today? Well, lately, I've been feeling really tired, and often I get frequent headaches and an upset stomach. Moreover, I've been getting a persistent cough for like the last three weeks. When did these symptoms start? I started feeling tired all the time about two months ago. Then, a few days after that, the headaches started. I got the upset stomach long before feeling the tiredness. Are you taking any medications? Only vitamins. What vitamins are you taking? I am taking vitamin C and a multivitamin tablet daily. Okay. Let me examine your vital signs. How am I doing? Everything is normal. No high temperature and your blood pressure is also normal. Please wait for a moment here. Thank you, doctor. I see here that you have started feeling tiredness two months ago and then frequent headaches. You're also suffering with an upset stomach and a persistent cough. Did you run a fever as well? No, doctor. Let me perform a quick physical checkup. Take a deep breath. Hold your breath for a moment and exhale. Repeat this again. Have there been any changes in your diet or your weight recently? My diet is the same as usual. However, I lost five pounds very recently. Did you ever suffer from insomnia? Well, it is pretty hard for me to fall asleep. I also wake up often during the night. Do you drink or smoke? No, doctor. Well, recently, the ownership has changed, and I had to work a lot of overtime at late hours, even during the weekends. I think you are suffering from pneumonia. Other than that, I do not see any other problem. The reason could be probably the stress at your workplace that causes headaches, upset stomach, and sleeplessness. For now, try to relax yourself and start doing exercises. Meet me again after you receive all the medical diagnosis reports. I'm going to prescribe medicines for bacterial pneumonia. Are you allergic to any medicine? Not to my knowledge. I want you to do a blood test and urine test to identify the bacteria Streptococcus pneumoniae and Legionella pneumophila. Is it something serious, doctor? Not at all. I doubt that could be bacterial pneumonia. Take levofloxacin, 750 milligrams orally, every 24 hours for 7 to 14 days. I want to know my cholesterol level. When will I get the medical reports, doctor? You will get the medical results in two weeks. Don't stress yourself. Everything will be okay. Can pneumonia be prevented, doctor? In most of the cases, pneumonia can be prevented. You can have a vaccine to defend against pneumonia once you get all these medical investigation reports. I would suggest Prevnar 13 pneumonia vaccine. That is very effective against 13 types of bacterial pneumonia. What food should I include in my diet, doctor? Have plenty of fruit juice and fresh fruits, yogurts, milkshakes, smoothies. Eat plenty of full cream milk or yogurt or even ice cream with light meals of lean meat, fish or eggs and cooked vegetables. Thank you, doctor. You are welcome.
That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at the question 25. You hear a discussion about common types of neuropathic pain. Now, read the question. Hello, Doctor. What are the common types of neuropathic pain? Well, while there are countless types of neuropathic pain, some of the prominent types include carpal tunnel syndrome. It's caused by nerve compression in the wrists and causes pain in the wrist, thumb and fingers. Central pain syndrome can occur after nervous system damage, such as a stroke. Degenerative disc disease, one may feel neuropathic back pain if it causes damage to the nerves entering or exiting the spine. Diabetic neuropathy causes stabbing pain in the hands and feet of some diabetic patients. Phantom limb pain can occur in some patients after a limb is amputated. Postlepetic neuralgia is brought on by an outbreak of shingles and persists after the condition has cleared. Pudendal neuralgia is a type of pelvic pain caused by compression of the pudendal nerve. Sciatica is caused by compression or irritation of the sciatic nerve and often results in shooting pain that radiates down the back of the leg. Trigeminal neuralgia is characterized by shooting neck and facial pain. Question 26. You hear a discussion bronchodilators used to treat chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Now read the question. Hello, Doctor. What are the different types of bronchodilators used to treat chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? Patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are often prescribed a bronchodilator, a type of medication for relaxing the air passages to help breathe better. Typically, the medications are inhaled through the mouth using a metered dose inhaler, but also come in liquid, pill, injectable or suppository formulations. The three classes of bronchodilators commonly used to treat chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are beta-adrenergic, beta-agonists, anticholinergics, methylxanthines. Beta-adrenergic agonists are a type of medication that binds to specific receptors in the lung called beta-adrenoceptors. By doing so, they block the trigger to bronchial spasms and allow airway passages to open. Beta-agonists can either be short-acting or long-acting which are delivered either orally or through a metered dose inhaler. Generally, the inhaled method is preferred as it alleviates symptoms faster. Anticholinergic blocks the neurotransmitter acetylcholine in the central and the peripheral nervous system to its receptor in nerve cells and inhibit parasympathetic nerve impulses. Methylxanthines affect not only the airways but stimulate heart rate, force of contraction and cardiac arrhythmias at high concentrations. Question 27. You hear a discussion about pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Now read the question. Doctor, what are the various types of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors? There are different kinds of functional pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Gastrinoma usually forms in the head of the pancreas and sometimes forms in the small intestine. Most gastrinomas are malignant. Insulinoma forms in the head, body or tail of the pancreas. Insulinomas are usually benign. Glucogenoma forms in the tail of the pancreas. Most glucogenomas are malignant. VIPomas, which make vasoactive intestinal peptide. 
somatostatinomas, which make somatostatin. Question 28. You hear a discussion about melasma and different types of melasma. Now, read the question. Hello, Doctor. What is melasma and what are the types of melasma? Well, melasma is a common patchy brown, tan or blue-grey facial skin discoloration, normally seen in women during their reproductive period. It typically appears on the upper lips, upper cheeks, forehead and chin of women of 20 to 50 years of age. There are four types of pigmentation patterns are diagnosed in melasma. Epidermal, dermal, mixed and an unnamed type found in dark-complexioned individuals. The epidermal type is characterized by the presence of excess melanin in the superficial layers of skin. Dermal melasma is defined by the presence of melanophages throughout the dermis. The mixed type includes both the dermal and epidermal type. In the fourth type, excess melanocytes are present in the skin of dark-skinned individuals. Question 29. You hear a discussion about possible causes of arthritis. Now, read the question. Hello, Doctor. Can you tell me what are the possible causes of arthritis? Osteoarthritis is associated with cartilage damage. Genetic conditions are thought to play a role in osteoarthritis. Age alone is no longer seen as the cause of osteoarthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease that develops as the immune system malfunctions and attacks the body's own tissues. Gout develops when excessive uric acid accumulates in the body and crystals are deposited in the joints. Reactive arthritis causes joints to become inflamed as a result of an infection that triggers the immune system. Usually, this condition resolves. Question 30. You hear a monologue of a physician on granulomas. Now, read the question. Granulomas are tissue nodules of immune cells that occur in diseases such as sarcoidosis and tuberculosis that can damage many organs. It is the chronic activation of the metabolic sensor mammalian target of rapamycin that is responsible for the granuloma's formation. In sarcoidosis, this mechanism leads to a course that is chronic and difficult to treat. Since mammalian target of rapamycin inhibitors belong to a group of drugs already licensed for clinical use, these findings offer new and quickly testable treatment options.
That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you will hear two different extracts. In each extract, you will hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer, A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at extract 1. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You hear the lecture given by a physician on the topic amyotrophic lateral sclerosis disease. You have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is a kind of motor neuron disease referring to a group of progressive neurological diseases that cause dysfunction in the nerves that control muscle movement, resulting in muscle weaknesses and changes our body functioning. The advanced stages of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis affects the nerves that control breathing, resulting in mortality. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is sometimes called Lou Gehrig's disease, after the famous baseball player who was diagnosed with this condition. Upper motor neuron symptoms include resistance to movement in the muscles and brisk reflexes and stiffness. Lower motor neuron symptoms include muscle atrophy, weakness, and twitching. The lifespan of the patients with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is about three to five years after the appearance of the symptoms. Presently, there is no cure to amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and treatment is aimed to relieve symptoms, to provide emotional and social support, and to slow down the progression of the disease. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis attacks the nerve cells used in voluntary muscle actions called motor neurons. Motor neurons are found in the spinal cord and in the brain. As amyotrophic lateral sclerosis progresses, motor neuron cells degenerate and die. Therefore, they stop sending messages to muscles for performing actions. At this stage, the brain can no longer control voluntary movement, and the muscles gradually weaken and waste away. As amyotrophic lateral sclerosis progresses, it affects all the voluntary muscles, where the patient can no longer control their face, arms, and legs. At this stage, inability to breathe results in respiratory failure. 50% of the patients with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis will live for three years or more after the diagnosis. However, some patients live for longer. About 20% of patients will live five years or more after diagnosis, while just 10% of the patients will live for 10 years or more, and 5% of patients will live for 20 years. There are different types of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, classified based on their signs and symptoms and with a genetic association. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis can be sporadic or familial. Sporadic amyotrophic lateral sclerosis occurs randomly, and it accounts for 90 to 95% of patients. There is no clear risk factor or cause. 
about 5 to 10% of patients are with inherited amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. The offspring of a patient with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis will have a 50% chance of developing a similar condition. Disorganized immune response is also a cause for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. The immune system may attack some of the cells of the body, possibly killing nerve cells. Chemical imbalance is another cause for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, where the patients often have higher levels of glutamate secretion, a chemical messenger in the brain near the motor neurons. Higher levels of glutamate is known to be toxic to nerve cells. Mishandling of proteins can also cause amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, when body proteins are not processed appropriately by the nerve cells. Hence, abnormal proteins potentially accumulate and cause nerve cells to die. The symptoms of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis usually start appearing in late 50s or early 60s. However, symptoms can appear at other ages as well. Progression of the disease will vary between patients. Common symptoms include difficulty carrying out daily activities including walking, increased clumsiness, weakness in the feet, hands, legs, and ankles, cramping and twitching in the arms, shoulders, or tongue, difficulty maintaining good posture and holding the head up, uncontrolled outbursts of laughing or crying, known as emotional latability, cognitive changes, slurring of speech and difficulty with voice projection, pain, fatigue, problems with saliva and mucus, and difficulty breathing and swallowing in the later stages. Early symptoms of the disease often include abnormal limb fatigue, clumsiness, slurred speech, and muscle cramps and twitches. Symptoms will spread all over the body as the disease advances. No single test can diagnose amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, so diagnosis is based on test results and symptoms to rule out other possible conditions with similar symptoms. The diagnosis of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis are made through electromyography to detect electrical energy in the muscles and nerve conduction studies to test the significance of the nerve signals. These diagnosis methods can help rule out peripheral nerve damage or peripheral neuropathy and muscle disease called myopathy. Certain medical conditions that produce similar symptoms to amyotrophic lateral sclerosis include Lyme disease, multiple sclerosis, HIV, West Nile virus, and the polio virus. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is confirmed in case there are symptoms in both the lower and upper motor neurons. Upper motor neuron symptoms include resistance to movement in the muscles and brisk reflexes and stiffness. Lower motor neuron symptoms include muscle atrophy, weakness, and twitching. Now look at extract 2. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 
to 42. Breast cancer is not one single disease, but actually 10 distinct types of tumor, dependent upon a woman's genetic makeup. That is the finding of the largest ever study of breast cancer tissue and could provide more targeted treatment. Our science editor, Tom Clark, is here to tell us more. Tom, it sounds dramatic, 10 different diseases, effectively. This study is, is one of the most sort of powerful in, in recent years to illustrate the what new genetic technologies are allowing scientists to do in sort of redefining how they understand disease. And it's a big step towards this idea of tailoring disease treatment to the individual, this idea of personalised medicine, in this case, for breast cancer. Nowadays, today, at diagnosis, how serious a breast tumour is, is largely judged based on how well uh, tests, how, how it responds to tests for the two particular breast cancer drugs that are available to treat the disease. And this study sort of turns all that on its head. It looks at 2,000 tumours from women in the UK and in Canada. It's the largest study of its kind. And what it found by looking at thousands of genetic mutations within those tumours is that, yes, breast cancer isn't one disease, but it falls into 10 very discrete genetic groups. And which genetic family the breast cancer belongs to has a strong bearing on how serious that tumour might be and how well it responds to treatment. For example, one class that they've, they've identified, which according to current tests would be grouped as you know, quite difficult to treat, in fact only has about a 10% mortality rate after 10 years, not such a severe type of cancer. Conversely, another group uh, that they've identified, which would have a sort of fairly positive treatment profile based on current tests, which in fact has a 60% mortality after 10 years, a really nasty type of tumour. More interestingly, um, another new class that seems to belong to these very lucky group of women whose immune system gets involved and sort of fights their, their cancer for them, of particular interest to scientists. And as the report's author told us um, earlier, this should ensure in future that women get the right treatment for their disease. If it's 10 diseases, it means that they'll require different diagnostic procedures, they will be associated with different clinical outcomes, and they will require different treatments. And so it's a big step forward in terms of how we manage women with breast cancer and how we, we need to not think of it as one or two or three diseases, but m a much more complex entity that will require, therefore, more tailored treatment. More tailored? So... Less mastectomy, more mastectomy, less tamoxifen. I mean, how is it going to Won't look? Dictate how a doctor, the, the, the tools the doctor has in his armory to treat cancer, but it will prevent. For example, it will help identify those women who've got a particularly nasty type of tumour, and make sure they get the right kind of treatment early on, possibly the more radical types of treatment. But it could also, on the other hand, and just as importantly, spare some women very toxic, very expensive chemotherapy that their tumour might not necessarily need. 
Um, I should point out that they've identified these 10 groups. It doesn't mean these tests will be available tomorrow. They've got to do clinical trials to prove that what they've seen in this study translates into the hospital environment. But Cancer Research UK, which funded the work, and now immediately they're going to start funding trials to look into this. So there's the chance that women who are newly diagnosed with, with breast cancer will be able to enrol in those studies. I just want to mention one more thing. Looking at all these, you, you, you asked about new tools in the armory. Um, women, uh, by looking at so many genes in this study, they've identified some quite promising new targets for those uh, for, for, for companies to look at to develop new medicines for treating breast cancer. Tom Clark. Now, a quick summary of tonight's news at 7.29. Uh, a Libyan military commander is taking legal action against Jack Straw following allegations the former Foreign Secretary personally permitted his legal, illegal rendition. Lawyers representing Abdul Hakim Belhaj confirmed legal papers had been served on the MP. Unemployment in Britain has fallen for the first time in almost a year. The jobless total fell by 35,000 in the quarter to February to 2.65 million. The government says the figures were a step in the right direction. And as Breivik, who killed 77 people in a bomb and shooting attack in Norway, told the court that the death penalty or a full acquittal were the only logical outcomes for his massacre. And Home Secretary Theresa May has dismissed terror suspect Abu Qatada's latest bid to avoid deportation as a delaying tactic. His lawyers lodged an appeal with Europe's human rights judges, effectively blocking the government's attempts to deport him to Jordan. And still to come tonight. Court. In a moment, cameras are allowed in court for the first time to record the sentencing in a murder trial. Is this the start of a revolution in how we view justice? And at 7.38, inspire a generation. The Olympic motto is unveiled as the 100-day countdown begins. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.